So thank you. Um, and to some extent, the previous discussion uh, has set the scene perfectly for my talk. Artificial intelligence, we cannot be um, avoid this in every headline, and it generates both excitement and fear that it will take away our jobs as ophthalmologists or be intrusive about our personal lives. And just to remind us all about some basic definitions, so artificial intelligence, very old definition from the 40s of uh, developing machines that mimic the way that humans think. And there are subgroups of artificial intelligence, machine learning, which is where you have an algorithm that modifies the way it works without explicitly being programmed. So example, you give it more data, it alters the way it thinks, you're not actually re personally rewriting the code. And a subset of machine learning that's grabbing all the headlines is deep learning that is a machine learning algorithm, but has a specific structure called a multi-layered neural network and specific ways of training that, that makes it exquisitely good at image recognition, which as a retina specialist is incredibly important. And where are we now and why am I so excited at it? Despite all the hype, this is really delivering. And in fact, small aspects of it are already in clinical practice. And as we've heard from the previous discussion, will clearly uh, impact our daily practices uh, increasingly in the foreseeable future. And this is an editorial we wrote in ophthalmology that summarizes a lot of the points I'm going to make. So there are already machine learning algorithms for biometry, the Hill RBF form formula, uh, visual field analysis, although they're not C, uh, um, sort of FDA approved, there's lots of uh, algorithms that look at optic nerve cut cupping progression of uh, uh, visual fields, and I'm going to concentrate on really the retinal features in my talk. And there are all sorts of uh, applications from preclinical imaging to development of biomarkers, diabetic screening, which is really where we're already at clinical deployments, to uh, um, how you manage patients in the real world in busy clinics. And I've been interested in this area since really the late 90s when I was a uh, resident doing research in the States with looking at the uh, inundation of cytomegalovirus retinitis in the AIDS era. And we wanted to detect this uh, and screen for it. And I worked with Caltech students to get some reasonably good algorithms that did that. And to date, what we're really doing with AI, AI machine learning algorithms are to detect things that we can already detect. So Drew's and diabetic features. And I'm gonna go into the end of the talk, some examples of AI detecting things that we as ophthalmologists can't see. So where we are, are already, and what really excites me is that this problem of mass screening of diabetes, we are very fortunate in the UK that we've had screening, not by optometrists, not by ophthalmologists, but by technicians that are trained to detect, um, look at the pictures of our diabetic patients every year, our 2 million diabetics, which averages at 10 million images a year, which is a huge burden even in the UK system. And if you've got 100 million in diabetics in India and China, that's half a billion images you have to read every year. And there are lots of algorithms that are in, have gained a lot of press saying we can detect diabetic retinopathy, but how do we know they are good enough to deploy. And I'm just going to give you the premise of why it's important to understand the flaws and why we need to test these things independently. So in a very simple example of a, a machine learning algorithm is regression analysis. So it's something we all learned at medical school. So an example, if you want to compare the number of hemorrhages in a photo to the area of ischemia, you can plot out different pairs of images and then draw a line. And then you can put a new picture with a number of hemorrhages and try and predict the area of ischemia. But instead of plotting a line, you can join all your data up with a lovely squiggly line, which put, look, matches your data beautifully, but is very poorly predictive. And this is the example of overfitting. And this is some of the flaws in the early facial recognition algorithms where it was trained on white males and did brilliantly on white males because it fitted the data of white males that it was trained with beautifully. But as soon as you put it at other racial or sect uh, genders, it performed pretty poorly. So it's very important you understand how you train these algorithms and how generalizable they are. This is something called overfitting of your data. And then you say, well, how good is it? 
And you can say it's as good as humans. What sort of humans? Untrained humans? Ophthalmologists? A group of ophthalmologists? Because we disagree. So when you look at these papers, it's not just about the algorithm, the generalizability is what you're comparing it against. So one of the things I've been very interested in is how we independently validate these things. And clearly diabetes is the biggest challenge. And we were fortunate to get an NHS uh, government grant a few years ago to look at all available CE marked algorithms and uh, look at an adequately powered study um, and cost effectiveness for these algorithms. So we powered the study. You needed 20,000 consecutive patients to feel confident that the results were true. We looked at multiple different cameras, photographers, graders, and a very good um, spectrum of ethnicity and real world data. Patients had cataracts, other pathologies. And we've published this and shown that two of these algorithms, even these older alg algorithms, were at least as good as trained human graders, would save the NHS 10 to 15 million pounds a year. And even these older al algorithms process about 600,000 images a day on, cl on cloud based systems. So they are. Now some of these are both CMARC, FDA approved, and we are, are in the implementation stage. We hope uh, COVID notwithstanding of implementing this in the diabetic screening systems in the UK. We're looking at how these systems also work on wide field imaging, which may actually give us even better results. Can we leave it to the regulators? The FDA just do studies on seven or 800 patients. Ours was 20,000 because even if an algorithm detects all proliferative disease on 800 cases, your confidence intervals are huge. And the, but the FDA say, well, actually, we may not even need to do that. We can trust Google or IBM or these big companies to test themselves. But we've seen with recent aircraft disasters, that may not be a good thing. So I'm very passionate about how great these algorithms is, but they need vigorous independent testing. Um, I'm now just going to briefly talk about biomarkers. The other area of interest is developing algorithms that will actually detect features for um, both population studies and our patients in our clinic. So um, biomarkers being, can be trained to look at specific features or have sparse, sparse detection, such as AMD. So you can have an algorithm that we can say has a label, it will detect AMD or not, but what's it looking at? And this is some lovely work from Aaron Lee, where he masked the image and showed the deep learning algorithm picked pick these bright areas differentiating a normal from AMD. We've looked at this now, there's some nice work from Praveen Patel, where they've segmented the RPE and shown that in the UK biobank study of 80,000 patients, how RPE Brooks membrane changes change with age and race. So these, these great algorithms are not just useful for our clinical patients detecting diabetes, but it's going to be really important in research when we start getting large data sets. We can also segment choroids from this work from Peter Maloka's group in, in uh, Switzerland. And this is some really uh, pivotal work from the Moorfields Deep Mind group led by my colleague Piers Keen on the clinical side and the great programmers from Deep Mind, where in this um, early, uh, this sort of baseline study, we can detect key features that will help um, triage patients to whether they need to be referred urgently to optometrists or not. This needs further validation work, but just shows the principle. So further work is needed before clinical deployment. And Urschler's group has now developed some quantitative aspects to such algorithms. So my interest is really understanding AMD more. And this is part of a grant we're doing um, and Roy Schwartz is leading on this presenting at Uretina next week where we can detect reticular pseudodrusin, even on old first generation OCTs. And we're trying to bring it all together. And this is work we've been doing now with University of Nijmegen for the last two years on very large EMR OCT data sets. We're not just quantifying all the key features of wet AMD. We're now picking up all the features of a trophic and dry AMD and quantifying each of those features and trying to put it all together. Again, this is work that's under, under review and is being presented at Uretna from, uh, by BART next week. And this is an example of the output showing each of the key features, including atrophy, subretinal drusenoid deposits, ellipsoid zone loss, et cetera. And we think when you actually start applying this into clinical practice in busy injection clinics, in optometric practice, this will really enhance referral and reduce the burden of optometrists in busy injection practice. 
But what we'd love to do is unify this with home monitoring. And this is a device developed by Peter Maloka. It's a binocular OCT. The patient puts their face down on, on the little device. They hug around the device. And the top is uh, an example of the OCT from this device that takes two seconds to scan both eyes. The bottom is a high-grade commercial OCT. And the idea is that the AI algorithms that we're developing will say, you need another injection or you need another scan in a day or two, and then we'll alert you when you need a treatment. But can we go beyond what humans see? see? So what I've described so far is things that we see, but it reduces the burden on us, or because the data volume is so large. We're now starting to see develop algorithms that detect things we can't see. And this is some really pivotal work here from Aaron Lee's group, who was a fellow with us, who's now um, a professor at the University of Washington, Seattle where he said, well, can we train, is there information on a structural OCT that may suggest flow? So he cross-trained structural OCT with angio-CT. So there's no way on a structural OCT you could detect flow. It's a single static image. But there, there may be hidden information in an angio-CT or a structural OCT that in, 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 uh, uh, infers that flow may be there. And remarkably, that worked. And so this is an example of the structural OCT showing the small vessels. This is the OCTA, and this is the output of, of where the flow is inferred on a structural OCT. And we validated this looking at patients with capillary dropout vein occlusions to show you there is inferred information on a structural OCT that if you train it, you can pick that out. And we've now, uh, his group has also done this with functional data. So uh, uh, in, inferred micro perimeter data from a structural OCT. So this is some incredibly exciting thing and are now starting to go to the point beyond what we can see. But what excites me now is what we can do now, which is diabetic screening for all our patients at a cheap deployable cost and potential to integrate these exciting algorithms into our daily injection practices our biometry and our glaucoma detection. There's almost too much to talk about. It's such an exciting area. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Adnan. It is a really, really uh, wonderful presentation and it will be future, uh, looks like maybe for all other ophthalmology area or other medical area. Um, my question is, uh, would you trust 100% uh, artificial intelligence uh, for screening uh, diabetes uh, if it would be the high, even highest level, uh, the best level? Would you so, trust according to this? Would you treat? So that's a really interesting question. So one of the things is, what are we comparing it against? And that's human graders human graders have an error rate. We don't admit we have an error rate, but there's plenty of data showing that we miss even proliferative disease. Our agreement on things like ERMAs is about, the CAPRA is about 0.3. And we have in the UK very good data on what our error rate is. We have shown these algorithms are as good and prob uh, as, as, uh, as uh, human graders. And these are human graders cross-checked with the Tahini Reading Center. And unlike us, don't get tired. Um, we um, have developed very tight confidence intervals. And on the, on the recent study we did on the new algorithms on 30,000 patients in three centers in the UK, it did not miss a single uh, uh, proliferative or severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. It missed the odd maculopathy, which in screening terms is um, not going to massively affect patient outcomes. So yes, I do in this, um, and I would say I'd actually trust it more than probably screening at passport control, because at least we have open data on how good these are. I'm not quite sure how good the screening at passport control is. So, but we are there, but we really need to know the error rate and be honest about it. And it's as good as us. I think, yeah. I think that's an important point is that uh, as long as it's open data and uh, we know where the error rates are and where the error sources are, it's fine. But if it gets, uh, you know, a commercial business for a few uh, tech companies, that's where I would get worried because then maybe we don't know what the error rate is or the reason for it. So what, what do you think? 
I completely agree. And this is what, what the white paper from the FDA that says maybe the big tech companies know enough to police themselves, given the uh, you know F, uh, FAA debacle with Boeing makes me very worried. And I think um, so we're moving towards, uh, well, at least with the NHS, rigorous uh, independent evaluation before deployment on the NHS. CE marking and FDA approval are not enough um, of a good enough standard uh, for clinical deployability yet. If anything, I think we need to develop a new standard that would establish what we require from these companies or from these new and I think, you know, you've, uh, you've identified very nicely where we are, what is required, how you have to watch out for having, you know, uh, data that is being overanalyzed. I think those are extremely uh, good points. Michael. Uh, an interesting aspect that we have looked at uh, or, or an insight that we found when we were doing population studies is that, um, <clears throat> for instance, if you look at uh, glaucoma prediction, models um, as they're available on some OCT um, volume scan devices, they have a difficulty identifying not disease, but normality. So they produce a lot of false uh, positive, uh, a lot of false glaucoma warnings. And yeah. uh, <clears throat> if, if your um, data is based on patient populations, then you're biased towards detecting abnormalities. If you want to deploy something in an optometry shop, um, it should be population-based so that you have a proper weight uh, of, uh, of normality. So I think your point's incredibly well made. So what happens in the early papers on AI, they always produce what are called ROC curves, which is all the possible cutoff points of sensitivity and specificity. What we need as clinicians is a fixed point. We don't think about different operating points. We have a blood test that is either normal or abnormal. And then we test how good that normal, normal and abnormal is in the population of interest. And the reason we use AI is because it reduces the cost of us and there's not enough of us. So then you need a health economics analysis with the the, the risk of missing severe cases. You need to put all of that in. And as you said, that cutoff may be different in primary screening an optometrist and in an injection clinic with a retina specialist. So all of that really needs to be built in. That's really uh, well highlighted, Michael. There's one other issue, I have now, and that is, um, and we found this in sort of looking for the norm, as it were, and that is the... Um, differences between images from devices from different manufacturers. So if you're not careful, you end up with a gold standard for each of these companies. And I think what you're aiming at is a consolidated gold standard across the board. So um, we're fortunate. So in the UK has defined camera types for diabetic screening. So it's not one, it's multiple, multiple different camera types, but they have a certain pixel resolution and certain type of camera back. So we tested on all of those. So you need, you still need standards because different cameras have different pickup rates, even with humans on detection of diabetic features. So you need to standardize what we can see anyway, and then make sure those systems work on everything. And if you change the camera system in the future, you need to validate it again, potentially with that change. And that's built into the sort of work we're doing to make sure we future proof it as the, as the systems change and the imaging systems change. Device dependence is a big problem in photography, for example. Bill, well, I was going to say, Bill Chatler, do you want to um, make any comments from your perspective regarding AI and use in terms of corneal diagnostics? Obviously, in the cornea field, um, we're, a lot of companies are working on technologies to automate topography interpretation. Obviously, we talk about glaucoma. Um, I think retina is much further along than the interior segment. And I love all your work. Thank you. I think it's a great, I mean, the anterior segment is ripe for this, as you said, corneal topography, especially. Biometry is already there with kind of the Hill RBF. Um, and I'm sure as we get a pool, massive uh, refractive data outcomes, I think that will be great. Um, you need the data, but it's kind of getting there. Uh, and whether, when it's starting to get pulled, um, then I think you know you, people can go in and really get some great stuff out of that. 
very exciting. Yeah, but uh, as, a, as a refractive surgeon also, I would like to make a comment to Chris's question. Uh, I, uh, I need to see patients uh, we are, because we are not treating uh, disease. We are changing life quality of patients. This is a little bit different than retina because I need to see patient, how is his mood, if uh, he is type A personality, if he is suitable, if it is easygoing. I need to talk, I need to see relatives sometimes, even their clothes, their uh, behavior, their, their reaction gives me some clue. Um, I, this is not only topography and not, not make a decision uh, just with topography. It is impossible in refractive surgery. I always need to see patients. This is at the moment my feeling. Maybe in future there will be special artificial intelligence to give me a report about his mood, his heart beating or his excitement, maybe something like that. <laughs> so hopefully I'm sure there will be, but that's why I stick to retina and keep away from refractive surgery. I'll leave it to you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Wise decision, I agree. <laughs>